during the talks for your comments. If it's distracting, remember that you can always close that down. Also, we have turned on um, the captions at the bottom. You can also turn that off if you find that distracting. It does say some funny things, but it does often tries to go back and correct itself. We're gonna to be together for the next few hours. Please be sure to take care of yourself, have water next to you, stretch and move around if you need to. Today's salon is gonna be recorded and available for viewing on our website, maternalgifteconomy.org. So without further ado, let's begin. Our first speaker is Frida Weirden. She's the co-founder and series producer of WINGS, Women's International News Gathering Service, which provides women's voices and issues coverage to non-commercial radio. The project started with a contact list from a radio women's meeting called by Genevieve Vaughn at the Third World Conference on Women in Nairobi in 1985. The pilot was funded and distributed by U.S. National Public Radio, but Wings found a more receptive audience through the World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters, AMARC. Reardon's paper on community radio appears in the anthology Women and the Gift Economy. Welcome, Frida. We're so happy to have you. Thank you very much, Leticia, and everyone who's here. I have written my talk so that I won't probably go over time, so I'll just start now. Before I ever met Genevieve Vaughn, she was interested in and supportive of women's media. I think especially radio. In 1985, when the late Catherine Davenport and I announced that we plan to start an international women's radio show, two women gave us copies of a two-page list of contacts from a radio women meeting Jen had convened at the UN Third World Conference on Women in Nairobi. We wrote letters to all of them. We had not yet heard of email. A few months later, someone told us about internet, but at first, the only people we could communicate with on it were radio station engineers. Two of the women on the Nairobi list wrote us back, which was wonderfully encouraging. So it was a check we received in the mail from an anonymous donor after the pilot of our show came out. The pilot was funded with a director's discretionary grant by Sandra Ratley, head of the NPR Satellite Program Development Fund. I was operations manager of Western Public Radio in San Francisco by then, and I suppose that gave us a bit of cachet to get this award. But also Sandra is a brilliant, internationally active black woman who is now a, quote, behavior change communications specialist for Futuro Media Group. Shortly after she supported the WINGS pilot, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting canceled the Satellite Program Development Fund and started their own fund. Later, we applied to CPB for support, but they told us that a show about the global women's movement was, quote, an idea whose time has passed. <laughs> the head of Western Public Radio also thought our time had passed. He fired me from my job eight months into a nine month contract. His excuse was, that I had continued to work on wings without any funding. Catherine and I kept producing the program anyway. I had audio equipment of my own from when I'd worked for NPR and friendly women engineers would sneak us into radio stations to record our announcing and do mix down. It took a long time to give up on promoting wings to public radio stations. We, usually I, attended annual public radio conferences to promote our series so we got to sample the nature of the resistance. At a reception for a show called Marketplace, a man asked me, a show only about women, isn't that rather narrow? I said, not nearly as narrow as a show only about business. Women are more than half the people in the world. I take pride that Marketplace went on to include stories about women on a regular basis. Uh, maybe he took a hint. <clears throat> One time a panel about women in radio was scheduled at NPR conference. I asked the organizer to include wings and she said no, but that I could say something during the Q&A. When I stood up to speak, fresh air host Terry Gross 
who was receiving massive funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, yelled out, don't let her speak. She and her producer were still furious because I had once written to the program pointing out that they almost never interviewed women. And later I heard Terry had gotten her start on a women's program. Maybe that wasn't too much fun. The fear of feminism in public radio was overwhelming. In 1986, the anonymous donor, AKA Jen Vaughn, invited us to a women's radio gathering in Texas. She was seeking advice on where to spend $10,000 for women's programming. I was shocked that some of the women said that they would never use the word feminist. Some wanted to pay a grant writer $10,000 to raise $250,000 to start a women's program that would be acceptable to NPR. Apparently, there was a rumor circulated by my former boss saying Wings was not very good, and even the women I knew were being snitty. In the long run, though, they came to appreciate Wings. We are still in touch and sometimes collaborating. Fortunately, we found another outlet for Wings. In summer 1986, the US National Federation of Community Radio Broadcasters offered me $250 to attend a conference in Vancouver, Canada. It was the World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters, known by its French initials, MARC. Catherine and I both attended. We met really interesting radio women from other countries. During a plenary, I asked the speakers to say what women's program was carried on their stations. Some of the men didn't like the question and wouldn't answer, but Sony Esteus, a great man from Haiti, did reply. I'm sorry to say that he has since died. The contacts we made at that conference helped us understand how community radio is distinct from public radio, poorer, more democratic, and open to non-establishment ideas. We started getting content from more community radio women. <clears throat> Anne Mark held conferences every four years, and until her death, Catherine attended them on behalf of WINGS. She was active in forming the Women's International Network of MARC and helped lead the revolt that won a vice president for women spot on the board. Only women delegates could vote for that office. When I met Catherine around 1983, she was co-producing two women's shows. Excuse me, I choked up because she has died. She was co-producing two women's shows on community radio WBAI in New York. The WBAI is part of the five station Pacifica network. One of the shows was called The Velvet Sledgehammer and the other was 51% the women's news. <clears throat> After I moved to Washington to produce a docudrama series for NPR, Catherine called and asked me to go to cover the unveiling of Jeanette Rankin's statue at the Capitol, my first news assignment. How could I get the audio to New York? I went into my closet and alternated holding the phone to the tape recorder speaker and to my mouth while I read the script. I'm glad I never had to hear the result. <laughs> <clears throat> Catherine and co-host Judy Pasternak were able to use the studio phone and recorders at WBAI to call women in various countries and record them. This is part of the liberty that community radio can offer volunteer producers, a place with equipment and airtime with very little restriction, aside from what is mandated by the government, which was mainly about the dirty words. In summer 1985, I attended the National Federation of Community Radio Broadcasters Conference in DC. There were quite a few producers of women's programs there and Judy and I called a women's meeting. One of the things she brought up was the importance of women's news. We found a group that were sending text for women's news to be read over the air and another woman who distributed short feminist features. <clears throat> in November, when I got to San Francisco, I found Catherine now producing news and current affairs in the Women's Department of Pacifica Station KPFA in Berkeley. I am sad to say that the very vibrant women's department that had its own space and equipment would later be dismantled. Catherine was totally committed to radio reporting, did not currently have a place to live and was sleeping at the station. I invited her to move in with me and we started cooking up the wings idea. She was very news-minded and she used to say to me when I put too much information in a story, this is a news story, not a history lesson. But I had my own passion too and came up with the slogan, today's news is tomorrow's history. Keep women's actions on the record. Both Catherine and I were very influenced by Dr. Donna Allen who published the newsletter Media Report to Women. A major principle Donna espoused 
was that the women being covered must be heard speaking for themselves. So our other slogan for WINGS became Raising Women's Voices Through Radio Worldwide. Finding stories was a fascinating challenge. <clears throat> One time I randomly called the national radio broadcaster in Sweden and asked to speak to a woman producer. I'm a woman producer, said the woman who answered. What's the hot news about women in Sweden, I asked. Well, there's a new American diet plan. I said, that's not what I meant. And she said, well, there's a story nobody has covered. The women in the parliament got together across party lines and proposed a bill to decriminalize prostitution and criminalize the men. So Wings got the first scoop on what would be known as the Nordic model, still very controversial today. <clears throat> Another time, <coughs> excuse me. Another time we saw a woman from the USSR speak at the San Francisco Women's Building on International Women's Day. This was pre-Chernobyl and pre the fall of the Soviet Union. We told her we wanted to interview Alexandra Biryukova, who'd just become the first woman on the Politburo in 25 years. She got us to write out our questions and submitted the request through the Consul General. Weeks later, we got a package in the mail with a peculiarly shaped reel of tape. Russian state radio had done the interview and sent it to us with translation. We had finished our pilot, but knew we had to broadcast this. We got a Sovietologist from UC Berkeley to give context to the story. And that was our second wing show. After I lost my job at Western Public Radio, I developed a career, career as a telefundraiser for nonprofits like the Symphony and the Sierra Club. So Catherine and I did not starve. Eventually we got a few grants from local California foundations to help with production expenses. They only funded projects in California, however. <clears throat> After the San Francisco earthquake of 1989, Catherine and I moved to Kansas City at the invitation of a powerful new community radio station, which was one of the wing subscribers. By then we were distributing cassettes in the mail. And uh, after a while we stopped paying for the satellite because the community radio was really airing the shows. While there, I heard from Jen's cousin, Sissy, that Jen wanted to create a women's show for a shortwave station. Based on the campus of University for Peace in Costa Rica, Radio for Peace International broadcasts some syndicated community radio shows on shortwave, including WINGS, plus locally produced content. Jen sent me and the women program director of RFPI to a women's media conference in the Philippines called Who Calls the Shots? Among the women I met there were the radical sister Mary John Mananzan, what a great woman, some women who worked carving vegetables underneath a bridge, and my heroine, Dr. Donna Allen. The Philippines did not have licensed community radio, but women produced a radio show that bought airtime and a TV show that aired on government TV. They said if they did a program about a feminist issue, the next week they had to do a show about lipstick to keep from being canceled. The TV host was quite famous, both a Filipino senator and a race car driver. There was also a space bridge as part of the conference, a satellite hookup between Manila and Washington, DC. Unfortunately, it only seemed to work one way, so the women in DC did all the talking. This gave me an idea to try to get a women's channel on one of the new satellite radio networks. In 1991, the US government gave 100 channels each to two companies, Sirius and XM. First, I approached Sirius. They said they already had a women's channel in the works. It was being developed by the same guy who produced their beer and boobs program. In DC, I visited XM. Their program director said he programmed all their channels based on his own instincts. XM soon went bankrupt and sold out to Sirius. Now Sirius has bought the streaming service Pandora. I think they're gonna go under soon for the satellite part. Jen did create a women's program on shortwave and called it Feminist International Radio Endeavor, FIRE for short. She hired Maria Suarez, who's here today, to produce it and paid the station to let FIRE use the studio and to transmit it. Eventually FIRE got fired from the station and then the station got fired from the University for Peace. But the radio show FIRE went on the internet and made a specialty of live streaming from international events. One of my favorite interviews for WINGS, which has also been published in a communications textbook, is Maria talking about the impact of FIRE's media strategies at the UN's Cairo Conference on Population and Development. 
media is a gift that can meet many kinds of needs. One of my favorite examples is the radio listening clubs model from Southern Africa and Ghana. The reporters interview the people in the community, take the recordings to officials and ask for their response and so on, using their power as media to open blocked communications. A radio station in New England did something similar over the course of a year to help citizens develop a state care policy that was implemented. In 1991, the state health care policy. In 1991, I was one of many women that Jen Vaughn brought to the World Women's Congress for a Healthy Planet in Miami, organized by Bella Abzug's organization, We Do, the Women's Environment and Development Organization. Women from around the world named the problems that were affecting their environments and discussed in regional groups uh, in order to recommend solutions. The ideas were then taken to Rio and some made it into the famous Agenda 21 promoted by Al Gore. The recordings from Miami made a wonderful, and if I do say so myself, uh, uh, if I do say that myself, a documentary series that Wings has re-released several times. Among the speakers was Vandana Shiva. She explained why corporations develop non-self-producing seeds that stop the cycle of life. Uh, I'm working on another show with Vandana Shiva now. Wow, what a woman. I've had this, and I met her through Jen too. I've had the thrill of recording many other amazing women speakers, many of them at events put together by Jen Vaughn and her allies. The ability to share wise speeches with audiences around the world is one of my greatest pleasures. And it was one of Catherine Davenport's too. Catherine died of leukemia in September, 1992. I continued to produce and distribute weekly wing shows. Genevieve made me an offer to come to Austin, a community I knew well, to work for her foundation for a compassionate society. I learned a tremendous amount during the five years of working there in a large group of very diverse women, talking together, making events happen, collaborating on projects, correcting each other's practice, Jen did a great deal to encourage and educate media women, including setting up a house dedicated to teaching and production of audio and video. I remember her bringing in a group of women from Guatemala for media training, and also hosting summer retreats for media women, events called Women's Media Pool. There was swimming. One of the producers who worked with Jen, Trella Laughlin, introduced me to Austin Community Television. A very heterogeneous group of women came together weekly for nine years to produce Women's News Hour. Some of the interviews ended up on wing. And I want to say hi to uh, Suzette Cullen, who I hope is listening because she was one of our great team there. The difference between community and professional TV is vast. <clears throat> you can be yourself with community media. We took turns at the camera and doing interviews. Having a media outlet gives permission to ask people questions, and we called attention to many urgent issues. My time is just about up. I will add that in 2002, Wings and I relocated to Canada, where I worked part-time for 12 years at a campus community radio station, teaching and mentoring and encouraging people, but also helping create a sense of belonging. This is one difference between community radio and podcasting. Podcasting is more individualistic. I hope the community of cooperation that forms in the physical spaces of community media can continue into the future. Nowadays, it is possible for me to produce and distribute wing shows out of this loft of my home on an island and to be in touch with producers all over the world. Wings has ongoing relationships with women's programs in Australia and Switzerland and Cameroon and Florida, to name a few. A producer in Kenya can send a recording attached to email now. I can talk with an editor in Amsterdam through Messenger. The shows are distributed free through community radio networks and as podcasts. No more addressing envelopes to mail. Boy, that took a lot of time. We continue to receive some grant money to pay freelance producers that need it and to donate to community radio fund drives in support of women's programs. It also pays for internet related expenses, including the website and the tedious work of posting wings back editions to an archive for future historians. I miss being together in person, but I treasure getting together on Zoom. And I still have the gift of editing audio that keeps the global women's movement connected to listeners. 
This is a gift and a process that I love. Thanks y'all for listening. Frida, that's just wonderful. I was curious about the podcast relationship to community radio and you described it very well. Um, maybe more when the questions come about. Um, thank you so much for, for right. everything. You were the one who told me that you wanted to hear about how wings got started. So that's how that ended being the focus. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really important because, um, you know, many of us weren't around at that time. We, <laughs> we certain, I certainly wasn't on the radio. Um, I was very busy at, in the 80s dancing disco <laughs> so, with a lot of other people. <laughs> 10 years after I was dancing disco. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. And we'll have more for you during the question and answer period. For now, I'd like to introduce Maria Suarez, our next speaker. Um, Maria is calling in from Costa Rica as she was born in Puerto Rico. Maria Suarez Toro is a feminist journalist and activist in defense of human rights and an educator. She lives in San Jose, Costa Rica. And she's been there for almost 50 years. She's the co-director. She was the co-director of the feminist international radio endeavor, FIRE from 1991 to 2011, of which she was also the co-founder. She worked as an educator in literacy in many countries in Central America during the 1970s and 80s. And since 1998 has been an associate professor of communication at the University of Denver. Since 2011, she's been a correspondent for Haiti, Puerto Rico and Costa Rica for the news service for the women of Latin America and the Caribbean and since 2015 has been a coordinator of the community center diving ambassadors of the South Caribbean Sea, which is dedicated to archeological diving and recovery of the history of the Afro descendant population on the coast of Costa Rica. Maria Suarez Toro, welcome. Um. I'm really excited and I just saw the list of people uh, that are also uh, listening to us and it's very exciting to see people that I know and people that I don't know. So um, hello to all of you and I would like to begin by sharing with you the community where I live now. I live in the southern Caribbean of Costa Rica, very much south, very close to Panama. And this is a community where there is not one single um, a shopping center, no movie theaters, no building more than two stories high, no show, um, fast food stores, not one single one of them, five, protected areas of turtles, of coral reef, of wetlands, of ocean, of mountain, and also an indigenous territory. This is the most diverse community of all of Costa Rica, originally with a matrix of Afro and indigenous bribery population. And with all of these characteristics that make it a very special place in the planet, it has the highest level in the country of youth suicide. It's very difficult for us to understand that such a pristine, beautiful, and low level development, if you want to call it that way, low level because it's not more than two stories high and very extended socially and also environmentally that there would be the highest level of youth suicide unless we understand how the new generation has been dispossessed of all of the rooting 
that we at least knew as a generation, even though the process of unrooting us had started with ours, unless we understand that these places in the planet that are so protected and have been so protected by the indigenous populations are the ones that are being um, put under the highest pressure by the big corporations. In this context, and what was explained to you about who I have been, my life is totally different now. It's very different but it picks up from the rooting that I had in the feminist movement, in the women's movement, with my family and the upbringing that I had. I came here, I retired from fire to come here to fish, to come here to dive, to come here to live a simple life. And I ended up with the biggest project of my lifetime. And every day I remember everything that I've done before and all that we have done together because it's the only thing that has allowed us to make a contribution that I think is gonna be historical. I always think that because I am very positive. I started a diving center for youth here because I realized that if I wanted to live here very, for a very long time, if we lost the youth to drugs, we wouldn't have any present or any future anywhere in the planet. But I also understood in living here that this youth that was subjected to so much pressure had the wealth of listening to adults instead of to politicians. And that is why I'm going to tell you what I do now. The main thing that I do now, I still do radio. I do a community radio program here in a local radio station. I am a feminist and I organize women and we have a very intense group of young women working against violence in this community, violence against women. And I don't teach at the university anymore, but we are going to open a new university here with the University of Costa Rica. What I have done as a writer is to create a character. Her name is Tonaina, which in Yoruba language means sea light. I have created an ancestral matriarchal Afro Bribri woman who is the sea light that tells the youth in the community the stories ancient that have not been told and are found in the bottom of the ocean because here everything came by the way of the sea, but also that matriarchal ancestral character Tonaina tells the stories of what the youth and their parents and grandparents here are doing in this community to be able to survive dealing and using the rooted strategies that they historically had to protect and to keep this place what it still is today. Tonaina doesn't only tell the ancient stories, it also tells the stories of the youth here that is doing work for the common good without even giving it those words. Youth today listen only to grandmothers because they know that the politicians and even some of their closest older relatives have given up believing that the main thrust in life has to be love. Even Naomi Klein, after so many contributions that she has made, today has written a book that just came out that says how to change everything. And I was amazed to listen to her because she said that 
the youth today and all of us have so much more information than we ever did before that the tendency is to try to act out of fear and just look at the pandemic and it does not true just look at what's happening with the pandemic by the way i also live in a community that has no covid i'll tell you later why it has no COVID. but i think that the way we live here has something to do with it and some other reasons medical reasons but the fact is that the youth has understood as Naomi Klein has, that love is the paradigm that needs to prevail because we have so much information about what's happening with nature, what's happening with us, that the tendency is to try to act out of fear. And fear can mobilize, but it doesn't necessarily mobilize the best of us. And Naomi Klein has said in this last short and small book, what we have been trying to do here without really having the words that Naomi can put into her writing, that when you connect back to the grandmothers and the stories, to nature and its language to talk to us, to our own nature and our own history and our own roots and what it says to us, what emerges is love, which is the only paradigm that can allow us to thrive for a better world, despite the context that we have today. And when we connect, then we, have, we can have that. I have written 12 stories. Donaina has written 12 stories that are going to be published by the University of Costa Rica this next semester. And they are the stories of how the youth here, by asking us to learn to scuba dive, which was prohibited to them because it was so expensive, began to see in the bottom of the ocean artifacts of sunken ships and began to ask history and to ask us and to ask archaeologists what stories might be in those artifacts that have not been told yet and have found their roots back in Africa and are going to contribute to a science of archaeology that has dissociated from the fact that those who inherit the legacies of those stories are the ones that should be doing the research. And these are our youth here. Also, in looking at the artifacts, realized that the corals that had protected those artifacts from being exploited by treasure hunters, those corals that had become the artificial reefs that enhance the natural coral reefs here were in danger, are now contributing to an understanding that that fad about planting corals everywhere and massifying the planting of corals is a fad that when done as a fad instead of as a loving science of what the corals are telling us, are killing them because are fragmenting them, the ones that are alive, to try to build more without changing the conditions that have allowed for the corals to be dying. The kids, I call them kids because I'm old, but I should call them the youth and, and the children are grabbing on as the first generation that has access to science, but using it together with their ancestral knowledge. And Tonaina, as a storyteller, is the only thing that she is contributing as the grandmother of all of these communities is the fact that there are people here that are beyond what the mainstream paradigms are trying to let, lead us to believe that we have no chance on, to, unless we are a part of it. And the curbing of this tendency of youth towards suicide 
has had to do with their rooting and grounding of themselves in their own history, in their own doing, and in their own understanding that they have a place in this planet so long as they don't continue just aiming to be what their telephones show them that they have to be, the culture that is presented to them through the internet in their telephones, but in looking at themselves, at nature and their own history. Tonaina is a grandmother and that grandmother thrives because she had lost her light. When the first Africans who came here and she, and, and she had come from Africa to be here when the first enslaved Africans came, she discovered that many of the Africans that had come had been taken prisoners and we enslaved here and that day she lost her life and light and the youth diving today and reclaiming that story, finding it and finding the connection of that story to their own lives have given Tonaina her light back again. So the interaction between the older generation and our generation in the storytelling has a great potential to be able to be a factor, not the only factor, that allows us to connect intergener intergenerationally in a way that brings back the hope, that brings back the good knowledge, that brings back the health of our communities and of nature that we need today to be able to reclaim the hope and the expectancy that we can live differently, that we don't have only one model to be to have to follow, to be able to have a place in this world. Tonaina tells the stories of how the youth and the kids in the ocean use the same instruments that our indigenous communities use to be able to counteract colonization and it's called biomimicry by imitating the ways of nature to be able to resist the tendencies towards the death of nature. Tonaina tells the stories of how this use has been given scholarships by the black Afro-American divers, scuba divers to go to Florida to also research together Afro kids from your communities in the United States with Afro kids from our communities to do research in the Florida Keys, both about corals, but also about sunken ships. And we claim that history is not only local, but it is international. Tonaina also tells the story of how women were engaged in all of these processes in the development of these communities and had been rendered invisible. I tell the youth today, Tonaina tells the youth today, that when we were their age, 18, 19, 20, 30, as Frida has expressed very well, better than Tonaina or I, that when we were their age, if we did not have a voice, we were rendered invisible by society. But I tell the youth today that if they don't have a voice, if we don't have a voice today, somebody will speak for them. And that is what has led them to also begin to claim the spaces and the right to create citizenship science that integrates the scientific method with the ancestral method, but that has also allowed them to claim their place in media, in local media, and now in international media. It's really amazing how miracles, because they are miracles work, that this place out in the boondocks of the Southern Caribbean was looked at by Samuel Jackson. He's quite a character, by the way who did a series called Enslaved, 
about the search of something uh, that tells stories of um, enslaved Africans that came and have not been um, discovered yet in six countries in the world. And Samuel Jackson selected this experience of the Costa Rican youth looking for the identity of two Danish slave ships that came here by mistake and released 650 Africans free in the coastlines of Costa Rica that are totally disappeared from history until the kids are unraveling the story of the artifacts in the bottom of the ocean. This is a series that you can look at in epics. It's the fourth chapter and it has rendered visibility of the youth of Costa Rica uh, claiming and finding and doing archeology span at 16, 17 and 18 and discovering stories that have yet to be told. This I believe is one contribution, a small one, but a very important one because it is showing that um, the paradigm of a love relationship with the planet, a love relationship intergenerationally, a love relationship to everything that we do out of the common good is what can save us today. Tonaina is that, Genevieve, I learned that by doing everything we did and also by understanding that there was a matriarchal paradigm that uh, was more than just politics and that finally <laughs> if I have discovered what it is and it is the power of love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. That was very powerful. I look forward to um, your book coming out. I know that it'll probably be out in Spanish and hopefully translated into English so that we can also benefit from your stories. They're just, it sounds very exciting. Um, I, could you say again, the, um, the series, is it Samuel Jackson? Samuel Jackson um, has done a series that is called Enslaved. Enslaved. And it's a six part story of six places in the planet where there are research being done, well, there is research being done about slave ships with stories of Africans who didn't make it to the new world, new, um, that didn't make it um, to the Americas. And he chose Costa Rica as one, and that is chapter number four. And the interesting thing about that chapter, the rest of the chapters are about archeologists searching for those ships. But the fourth chapter, which is the one about Costa Rica, is a chapter about community and culture in the search for sunken ships. It's a very interesting and our kids are wonderful in it. And their parents and their grandparents had never seen them dive because they don't dive and they were able to see them for the first time in this series. It's really wonderful. That's so beautiful. The other thing I'd like you to just elaborate a little bit on is um, you mentioned that there's no COVID where you are and you were yes. going to, yes. Could you sh just say a little bit about that? Well, you know, every right now it's really important that we base our analysis on the science because everything is so politicized about this COVID and we have a, 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 a very scientific um, unscientific conclusion about why there is no COVID in this area. It turns out that now we have discovered scientifically here that people who have dengue have resistance to COVID and all of us have had dengue here. That's why there's <laughs> no COVID. Well, that is very interesting. Very. I had dengue at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic, I had dengue and I was so upset that, you know, I was so sick and I, I didn't have to stay anywhere. Um, you know, I didn't have to stay inside. 
But then now I realize that it was a blessing also. Yes, yes. Dengue, well, uh, dengue. Tracy is asking what is dengue. Dengue is, um, uh -huh. thank you, Jen. Yes, perfect. Well, we're very happy that you recovered from dengue and that it's giving you a bit of immunity to COVID. That's such an interesting thing. Um, okay, is there anything else you'd like to offer before um, I check in with Jen and see if she had some questions or comments before we open it up to anyone else? Um, you've done, you've lived many lifetimes and <laughs> you've done tremendous work and it does seem that you've wrapped everything up where you're now doing a multi-generational recovery, linking the stories, the important stories of the day to historical and scientifically based um, evidence so that the youth can find their place, that they, that they feel connected to the earth and they have a, a future for themselves. So thank you so much for that. Genevieve always reminds us that it is the gift of language, you know, and the voices are critical. And these are the most, the primary gifts that we give to one another. These stories that remind us who we are, where we come from and how we can move to the future together. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And I look forward to hearing more from the questions and I'd like to just check with Genevieve and see if there's anything you'd like to offer before we go into some of the questions. Well, thank you, Letitia. Thank you, Maria and Frida. I'd like to say that both uh, Maria and Frida have, have lived lives that are basically gifts, <laughs> that, that they have given the gift of communication. Frida has, uh, passing on the, the interviews with, uh, with women all over the world to, uh, to, the, to the general public. And Maria has done that as well as many other things that both of them have done. So I think uh, future generations will appreciate you and will look back on, on the two of you as, as foremothers. And uh, I, so I thank you too. And um, I just, there's so many different things that you have done. I, I would like to hear a little more about some of them. Like Maria, I know there's this uh, group you work with called Mano Vuelta. Yes. Can you tell us something more yeah. about that, for example? Yeah. Yes, that, that's very, uh, thank you for asking that because we were able to do Mano Vuelta precisely because there was no COVID in this area. So we were never isolated. And when the pandemic started and we started listening to it in the media, international media, I called one elder friend of mine, an elder is my age, 72. We call ourselves, elder, we are called elders in the community in recognition, not so much of age, but that we have um, experience. So I called an elder from Cahuita, which is one of the communities here, from Manzanillo and other communities, from Puerto Viejo and from Pocles, one other woman my age, and I said, look, everybody is isolating themselves even though we don't have COVID here. Are you going to isolate yourselves or are we going to go out and work because this is going to be there's not going to be any tourism because there's no COVID here, but people are not going to travel. And most people in the younger generation have gone into tourism and tourism is going to die for a long time. Are we going to let ourselves have this happen or are we going to organize something to get the elder women our age whose children are coming back home because they went into tourism and now there's no job? And where do they go back? to the grandma, to the house, and grandmas are have houses full of people that have come back because they have no jobs. Are we going to do something about this? So five of us, same age as, my, as me, 
got together and organized this mano vuelta means um, when you, mano is hand and vuelta is when you turn it around because it, there's a, an indigenous um, ritual that recognizes that we all need and can give together at the same time most of our lives. So you turn your hand like this when you need and you turn it like this when you have something to give. So that's what Mano Huerta means. So we started visiting some of the elder women who had their seven, eight, nine, ten children come back home to them, to their houses, with jobless. And we started talking to them and we organized and also to people in the city and internationally who could make a contribution of 25,000 colones a week. 25,000 colones is the equivalent to $50 a week for eight weeks to buy food for that elder woman who had their, her kids back home without any economy. And we went back and said, look, we can provide an hermanamiento, a sistering of families elsewhere in the world that are willing to provide food for your family for eight weeks so that you have food security for eight weeks in this crisis so that you don't have to worry about food but can think about what kind of economic livelihood you can rebuild that doesn't have to do with tourism. And Although we did it with what I'm telling you, the idea that we had to do something and we had to do it through the people who were taking the biggest brunt, which were the older women, the elder women, because their families were coming back. But what we didn't understand at the time, it, that it, intuitively, it was just brilliant. It, it was brilliant because this is the generation that lived free tourism. So they had their businesses and they had their livelihoods that they had been um, um, discontinued by the tourism and also because they retired, you know, like I retired and, you know, never really retired. And it was brilliant, not because we did it, because we didn't do it, but because one week after, when they were relaxed because they were gonna have food for eight weeks for their whole family, they were already building the alternative economies. And this is the Mano Vuelta that worked. And the main thing was besides being able to provide a livelihood for the family, is that most of the businesses, if you can call it that, that they recreated were about providing food for the community. So they went from being the victims or the victimized by the pandemic and its impact in tourism and the economy of the, of the area, they went to being the providers of food. They did journey cake with the coconut that they had done many decades before and had raised their families to be able to go to school and now we're doing in tourism, but now we're jobless with the same instruments of livelihood that they had raised their children to become who they were today, rebuilding them to be able to provide for the community and their own families. It was really amazing. And we said to them after eight weeks, not one more bag of food. And, and it's been amazing because I still see them. For example, um, the, the people who tended the gardens in the hotels, they became the advisors of people who wanted to grow food in their backyards. Um, the uh, providers of food that could be made with what was in the community, the organic food movement that grew out of understanding that we had, uh, that it was living as side by side with the tourism, but then now it become, became forefront. So it became the shifting of the condition of the victim 
of the tourism industry that destroys all the other, uh, supposedly destroys all the other uh, types of work and production and the victims of the pandemic, uh, even though there was no pandemic here, but it was international and we're all connected, they became the providers of food for all of their community. And so this has been an amazing experience during COVID. We never stayed in our homes one day. We didn't get sick either, but the community has uh, lightened up the ancestral ways of production that has allowed them to survive in this crisis. Wonderful. What a wonderful story. Yeah. And it's, it's I just want to say that um, both the, the diving, the storytelling, the Mano Vuelta, and also the Mano Vuelta stems back from the support that I was able to also build during the hurricanes in Puerto Rico with really with the support of um, Genevieve who has always realized and believed in the things that we do because she knows that they are also connected to everything that she contributed to who we were before that allowed us to make these contributions today. And I have to say that Genevieve. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Jen, are there any other questions that you might have directly? Because you know these two women better than we do um, that you might want them to be able to offer to us in the work that they've done. Well, I, I did want to ask uh, Frida to tell us something about how it is to uh, record the voices of so many women and and give the gift of their voices to the to the world. Um, and the uh, there's somebody that has said one time, the greatest gift you can give to a woman is the floor. That means that you give them the capacity to speak and give to that. And Frida, you've been doing that all your life now, all those the, the many decades that you've been doing this radio. So tell us a little bit about uh, what, it, what that's like to be able to give that gift to women to, to give them the floor and what it's like, what are some of the most exciting things you've uh, recorded, let's say. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a difficult one. And, and sometimes my favorite ones are ones that other people have recorded uh, instead of me. But uh, I get to, when I work on the shows, I get to listen to them over and over again. So it's like uh, getting to know them in a way. Um, I'm thinking about, oh, I'm just, when I get asked a question, sometimes my mind just freezes up and that's kind of what's happening to me. I'm now <laughs> trying to remember names of, of people. Um, who's that woman from the White Earth uh, Reservation? Uh, uh, that Winona LaDuke? Winona LaDuke, yeah. Uh, sometimes I reissue the, that uh, talk that uh, she gave because uh, talking about, you know, what they were doing there. And, I, and I've got some other audio I'm trying to figure out how to, to do about her. But, I mean, there have been Indigenous women, ones that I've recorded at some of your conferences and, and various uh, places uh, that have so much wisdom about how to um, how to live differently and think differently. And, uh, and that this, you know, I keep hoping that these ideas, that these lessons will spread and catch on. Um, yeah, you're, you're talking about the, the organic farming. Um, there, I interviewed a, a woman named Emmett Degger Mensi, I don't even know if I interviewed her or somebody else did now, but she's from Turkey and she's teaching permaculture. And then um, oh, we had a show about women and bicycles. <laughs> and uh, there have been a program about the, um, 
the children who are suing the U.S. government uh, for not, for allowing all this climate change to happen, and um, yeah, uh, oh, and what's her name who just died? Uh, the woman from Egypt. Uh, I, I see your mouth moving, uh, Maria. You remember it, but you're on mute, I think. Um, who was the, the woman from Egypt, the doctor, uh, the author who just died? I know it very well, but I'm just having a brain freeze. Somebody uh, uh, says Nawal El Sadawi. Nawal El Sadawi. Yeah, I mean, just my gosh, the things that that she said and so passionately. See, that's the thing that NPR could never accept was anything that had any passion to it. They're always kind of uh, making everything seem so level and, and, and uh, you know, and, and that's the part that I love is when women are really passionate and they really have ideas and experience and they, and they just tell it in, a, in that kind of way. And that strength is just, uh, it's irreplaceable. Um, it makes me very happy. Oh my gosh, that uh, that world, uh, the Women's Congress for a Healthy Planet. Every speaker was so brilliant. You were there, Jen. I was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and there's still women today um, making these speeches, and and there are women who are recording them. Yeah. It's wonderful. Frida, would you just um, say where your archives are being stored? I know that we'll put the information up um, with the recording of this session, but um, you keep saying that you're reissuing, but where are your archives stored? So if people want to see them or listen to them. Okay, so Lisa Hayes in Austin, Texas, whom Jen sent to Beijing and, uh, and Wairu with me back in the, 1995 is uh, still doing things with media and she is the person who is putting our uh, back editions of wings onto archive.org and under archive.org uh, I think if you search for wings colon women's international news gathering service you'll find it I don't have the link to this yet I mean it's been she's just got a few years up I mean there are more than 1500 shows to be put up so it's going to take her a while to get it all done but uh but anyhow that's one place where i chose that because it was started in association with harvard university i mean it's kind of like wikipedia it has that kind of massive support and the openness that um that makes it a good bet for long-term uh storage because i mean if we put our archive up on something where we have to pay every month when I die, what's going to happen, you know? So, uh, so anyhow, we're working on archive.org. But in the meantime, also, the most recent ones are on the new website that uh, a woman named Michelle in the Netherlands has put up for us. And it's, um, it's wingsradio.org slash WordPress is the way to get to it right now. And there's pictures too on that site, which I like. And then, uh, Wings, if you go to wings.org, that's our old website, which I lost the ability to edit after a while. Uh, and But if you click on the word archive near the top there, it'll take you to the uh, Canada's National Campus and Community Radio Association distribution website. And there are shows on that going back, some of them as early as 2008. And uh, you know that's, that's where things are now. Uh, we're getting the shows on archive.org all the way back to, uh, to 1986. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Frida. Um, in hours, can I, Leticia, can I say something about yes, fire? Yes, please. Because people have been asking us about that also, because the fire archives are already online, but it needs a lot of work of the 25 years. And a lot of work in changing the RAM files, the sound files into a, a, a recent and new format. And it means a lot of finger work in changing the format 
and in reorganizing. And Margaret, um, who was with us in the last 10 years, is retiring now from the University of Denver. Katarina and Yarman and I are going to get together here in Costa Rica this next semester to be able to figure out how to make a proposal to be able to update all of the archives into a format that can be heard today and find a women's studies university that can host them uh, so that we don't have to pay the same issue as Frida is saying. This is like our libraries, you know, if we find a place where we can put them that they can be made accessible to the public, when we die, they're gonna be, you know, they're gonna continue. I really believe that what I figure out to do today about anything in life brings all of the women that I have heard in the radio for so many years and the women that I have known. So I never believe that anything that I am doing, I can, you know, people say, how can you say, oh, it's brilliant what we just thought. I said, I can do it because it's a we. It's not that I have all these ideas. It's that I picked them up in the 25 years of listening to so many women all over the world and to my own women in my family that that's where they come from. So I have no problem saying it's brilliant because I said it because I didn't. It came from all of that. That's, <laughs> that's right. Genevieve reminds us that you can't do the gift economy alone. Yes. Right. We need each other and we need to be able to not only um, uh, we need to be able to innovate because both of you, Frida and Maria, you've seen the technology change <laughs> over the course of your careers and that we need to be able to adapt. We need to bring that information in a format. This is the, the voices that we need because there's the information enters into us in a different way when we hear it, when we're listening to it, than when we read it. So we need to hear the voices of the women. And um, I'm very excited to know that both of you are working to find ways in which we can preserve these women's voices and their uh, their own experiments, their own uh, intelligence, so that um, the generations to come can use that information to weave together the future. You know, a generational expression of weaving together the future that the foremother's wisdom is not lost. So, yes. So this is mothering the future, I would say. Oh, I love that. Grandmothering. <laughs> Grandmothering the future. Grandmothering the future. Beautiful. So are we ready for some questions? So let's have uh, Liliana, do you have a question for us, perhaps? I have a question from Joan Marler. She says, a profound thank you to Frida and Maria for your multidimensional presentations about your lifelong dedication to doing radio and working as community activists. You are treasures to all of us, including future generations. A question for Frida and Maria. With all of the obstacles you have overcome over the decades to continue to develop your work, what have you found within yourselves to be able to continue in the most difficult situations? That's one question. The other one is, what is your message for women of our time to have the courage to give the best of themselves, even in the darkest hours. Whoa. Either one of you, thank you. Um, all I can say is that having courage and standing up for is, um, is the most fun, you know? <laughs> And I think if the young people realize that, that they're probably not gonna be killed for it. Well, some people are, unfortunately, but um, you know, you want to make change. And if, if people don't stand up to make the, those kinds of changes and, and connect uh, with other people truthfully. Frida, did you go on mute? Where'd you go? 
I think she's dropped out. She'll be back in a minute, I'm sure. Okay. She'll be back. How? Let's go to you, Maria. There were the first question was about obstacles that you've overcome. Do you have suggestions? And then um, I. That's a hard one. Um, the three times in my life when I have been in a life or death situation, one during the war in El Salvador, another one. Um, disappeared in Honduras and another one uh, I can't even remember the third one but it's not that I can't remember it's that I can't talk about it the only 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 moving force that can really get you through when you have a chance is to have a voice and to know that you're doing what you're doing out of love. Why do I say voice? We just had a very important conversation with four other feminist women my age who were together in the war in El Salvador and were in life and death situations. And they were telling me that it was very important to justify using Guns. They are Costa Rican and we don't have an army here. We have no tradition about war. And they had to have guns in El Salvador because it was in the middle of the war and in the territories where the war was being waged. And I was there for four years and I never used a gun. And that's why they took me out because they told me either you use a gun or you have a gun and carry a gun or you're out. And I said, well, I'm out. I can understand why you use them, but I would never be able to use one. So they're gonna kill me with my own gun that I carry. And I and so the women challenged me and they said, so if you were in a case where you confronted the soldiers and the army, how would you do to survive? I said, I did. I knew I only had my voice and a clear voice of why I was in that situation that saved me. Some people did not survive because they didn't even have a chance to use their voice. But it's a clear voice and clear, I mean that you talk only what you live and what you believe. You don't talk bullshit. You don't use it to disregard anybody or to lie or to not be who you are. That can save you from many things and it can save you even when you have been in, in life or death situations and in crisis only clear voice and clear because it comes out of doing things out of love period thank you maria um Frida, we you got uh, interrupted. Uh, we'll come back to you, okay, Maria. But thank you for that beautiful, um, uh, honest and heartfelt uh, drop of wisdom. That's like a mic drop. That whenever you're in a situation, an obstacle that's life and death, that you need to use your clear voice out of love and be yourself, a hundred percent. Frida, you dropped out in the middle of your your response. Oh, yeah, the, uh, my uh, signal dropped and I had to re-enter. So I'm sorry I missed that. I don't remember what, oh, I was talking about, uh, I think I'd more or less finished what I was going to say, actually, when it, when it happened, uh, that um, I said that, you know, you, you probably survived saying the truth, except of course some people don't. And we just, I belong to the International Association of Women in Radio and Television. And uh, I'm happy to report that our uh, communications officer, uh, Lady Ann Salem has been released from jail. She was arrested and charged uh, with 
absurd charges of having weapons and being a communist and things like that. She's actually just an independent <laughs> journalist. And um, luckily, a judge uh, said that there was no evidence that the, the warrant was uh, specious and released her. But now the government is attacking the judge and uh, people have been killed there. A lot of uh, uh, just perfectly good community activists have been killed and, and so forth. Uh, and um, in Afghanistan, we had two, two members assassinated. Uh, you know, it, it's a scary time in the world uh, with a lot of, of violence rising up. But um, what was it? I think Audrey Lord said something about your silence will not save you. Yeah, right. it won't. Right. So better try saying. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Frida. Liliana, could you give us the second part of that question? The first yeah. part was about obstacle, and the second part was. What is your message for women of our time to have the courage to give the best of ourselves, even in the darkest hours? You have no alternative. <laughs> what is the alternative? Are you going to hide and, and let people just run over everything? What are, you, what are you living for? Maybe sometimes it's good to hide for a little while, but basically um, we're here. It's easy for me to say because I'm, uh, I'm in a safe place. So, thank you, Frida. So I, I remember the third time when I thought I was going to die. And I'm gonna tell you, I never talked about it. I fell in love with my psychoanalyst and it was a big mess of a relationship and I thought I was gonna die. Talk about transference, transference between women and power. And I thought I was going to die, and I didn't die because I went back and I talked to her, and I told her straightforward. And uh, it was a voice and clarity of voice what also saved me from that one because I was devastated. But going to the, to the uh, courage, Liliana, and it's good to hear from you also. Um, I believe women have so much courage. Just being a woman and surviving is so much courage. But we don't know that we have it until it's put to test. And hopefully we have each other to help us recognize the courage that we do all have by just surviving being women. And that is the strength that we have to build on, the one that we all have by resisting and surviving and the one that we have by getting together with each other to help us recognize the courage that we do have and using it. What did you say, Maria, that got you out of that situation? Because, was I, was, because I was, I told them I had three times when I was almost dead and, and what helped me survive. And I remember two and I didn't remember the other one. I said, I can't talk about it, but I could. sometimes I don't even remember what it is. But it was that. Mm. Yes, uh, Frida, Frida brought up radio as resistance. Right. And I think that's, you know, um, preserving and archiving, but actually both of you being able to raise your voices and amplify other women's voices that uh, provide wisdom and courage and inspiration for other women. And I wanna well, thank you both for that. The, the thing, Liliana, if, if having a voice individually as women is very subversive, giving a voice and having a public space where people can hear it is also a subversive, but even more. That's why we are persecuted. We're not persecuted just for being journalists. We're persecuting for being women who are journalists. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. Uh, and it's so important now 
because of the fake news and all the lies that our whole society is telling all the time and the lies of the advertising, the whole commercial uh, lies. So, you know, to hear an authentic voice that's telling the truth is is very, really, uh, it it cuts through all of that evil and and comes up with uh, something people can, can uh, feel with their hearts and, and have hope from. Yes, I agree with that. And I believe that's why I do the storytelling from the perspective of Tonaina and a maternal ancestral grandmother voice because children and you hear so much, they are so much more informed than we are, that they are petrified. But when they listen to their grandmothers, they know it comes out of love and their grandmothers listen to them also, not only talk to them, but listen to all the things that they have to say. And when you create character, whether it's in radio or in literature, or just in the way you relate to people. I mean, I'm not a grandmother, really. I'm not a grandmother. But now everybody looks at me like a grandmother, you know? And I, I at the beginning, I said, no, I don't want that, you know? No, I do. I do. Grandmothers are heard. They are the only ones that the kids listen to because they speak to them in a different voice. And so we bring that to radio. We bring that to literature. We bring that to what we do. We bring that to how we talk. And the kids listen. They don't listen to anything else. They get so scared that they stop listening. This thing about hope. Um... When we first started Wings, there was a woman who said that she went to take our show to put on a community radio station in Hawaii. And then she said, no, I listened to it and it was too depressing and I'm not going to put it on, ask them to put it on the air. And that's when we realized it was very early in the project that we would never do just an ain't it awful show. So much of what's reported about women is, oh, they're the victim of this, and oh, this terrible thing happened to women. And uh, we decided that we would always show, even if something terrible was happening, we would always show the resistance. We would always show the activism, you know, something that's successful in particular. And and that's been good. Mm. What do we... What's Tracy's question? What do we need now to bring something? And I can't read it. What do we need now to bring global stories from the communities we love? Of love. Of love, sorry. From the the communities we love. Um, Well, that's a very good question. Can you can you can you elaborate a little more, Tracy? What do you want to get to? Because we, I could talk, I could tell you. Well, radio is one of them, but I think you're talking about something else. It's in the chat. Something in the chat it says we need to write up a piece about how you both were supported and earned income with right. all Jen and others' support, but to also really encourage donors and community radio. Yes. So the okay. next generation express themselves not just in small online chats, but to a wider public. Well, I'll say okay. to donors, and uh, it's something Jen has said to donors as well. And I don't know how often it's listened to, but the thing that made Jen stand out as a donor was that she never micromanaged. She didn't require a bunch of written reports and forms to be filled out. She said, "I see that you have something that you're doing." Uh, here, let me help you with this and go do it. And that is so empowering. And I think that that's something over and over again that donors um, sort of refuse to understand that the, and it's the same thing with laws and all kinds of things. You know, when you create a system that requires all these constant proofs of what you were going to do and what you did, and you spend more time doing the paperwork and applying for grants that you don't get And all that, I mean, it's a huge waste of resources to do those things. And and the same thing is true in other fields. I know the 
the home care workers here on these islands, um, they, they used to work with a supervisor who, who trusted them and let them do stuff. And then these rules came in from the province where you have to write down what you did every 15 minutes and you can only spend 45 minutes with the person and you're not allowed to cook or bring them any food. And, uh, and you know, there's all this report, 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 and just, it destroyed what was a relationship of the caregiver or they tried to uh, with the, the person they were caring for. And so um, let's keep the bureaucracy uh, out of it, please donors, and you will get better results. <laughs> I think that um, what Frida's saying is really very true. Uh, but I remember what Jen told us when we discussed that at the beginning of FIRE. And we said to Jen, but we're gonna send you reports anyway because we have to be accountable. And Jen said, look, you don't have to send reports. Send them if you want to, but you don't have to. And I said, but why? She said, because I'm part of the same movement. I know what you're doing and I will see the results because we're part of the same movement. So what I learned from that experience with Genevieve is that we have to make other donors understand how they are part of the community and the issues that mm. you are putting on the air, if it has to do with radio or whatever, that, uh, the, that we are in this together, you know? We, I really believe that, that uh, the lesson that Jen taught us at the beginning, because you know, we were in Costa Rica and she was in Austin. So we said, how can we get money from somebody? who's going to fund this program. And we met Genevieve uh, more than 10 months after we were already on the air. And we used to meet in a conference call. Frida, remember, Jen? It was a big deal that we could all talk together on the phone. But we never met each other until the Women's Congress on the Environment. And we had already been doing fire and were being funded by this woman who we had never met. But she let us know we are part of this movement. We are in this together. Don't send me any reports. I'm going to know if you're doing well and I'm going to know if there's things that we can do better and we'll do them together better. That's the relationship that we, Katarina, and all of us who had that experience with Jen have been, have been carrying over to all our other experiences. That when it has to do with donors, they have the particularity which is very important that they have the funding, but they have to realize that they are part of the movement to change this world, you know? And yeah. that's the kind of funding that we're gonna get anyway, because nobody who's against what we all believe in is gonna be providing funding for that. They keep it for themselves. Yeah. Yes. And there's one other thing that, that I've seen um, written recently about uh, donors and and the problem with uh, that a donor comes in with an idea of some kind of thing that they want to fund and often it's very narrow and then the other thing is it's very short so they they start something but there's no ongoing support for the project and if it hasn't uh, had some way to become self-sustaining which is often the case it's dropped and I think a lot of, uh, I mean, I agree with this article that said a lot of money is wasted by being invested in projects that then fail because they, they haven't uh, been supported long enough. And, and Jen, I mean, I know you've done lots of short-term funding that made something happen, uh, you know, over the short term. Or like, I think of uh, Techno Mama and how you sent uh, those women out with computers to go to women's organizations and teach them how to use computers. I mean, that was a great short-term project. But then for some of the projects like FIRE and like WINGS, you've been in it for the long term. And, uh, you know, just I, those things would not have continued without you, I think. Because when did we have time to, to go out and, and, and uh, well, I mean, I'm living on social security now, so this is good for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason that I, I did it that way is because, 
I have a strategy for social change, which is the gift economy, and that I'm trying to promote as an alternative way of doing based on uh, on the maternal uh, care, let's say, and and uh, the fact that all children are born uh, vulnerable and incapable of taking care of themselves, and so they elicit the kind of other oriented care that they have to have in order to survive. And we have been, you know, eliminating that from society uh, for centuries. And, and we need to bring it back because it's the same kind of care that Mother Earth gives. And, uh, and, we've, and, and we've got to understand how the market um, takes away all those gifts and exploits them. And so, I have a framework that mm -hmm. I put the funding in mm -hmm. and uh, that that made it more um, uh, long term because that is a very long term project that I'm working on myself and uh, but that we are all working on in a way because of, of, of the values that we have and we're expressing in in all the different ways that social activists especially feminist social activists do uh, express. So that's right. the reason. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jen. Um, are we ready for another question? Because I think Judith might have one for us. Judith, are um, you ready? Yeah, I was going to turn my video on, but it says that I can't. Um, this is uh, uh, more questions from um, Tracy Gary, who is in Northern California and uh, co-founder of the Women's Building that uh, Frida mentioned mm -hmm. and some other nonprofits. Um, and there's a, a, a series of questions. Um, I'll ask them one at a time. Uh, Maria has partly answered this one already. What are you learning from your intergenerational work? Um, so that's that for, for, that's for both of you. Uh, you've okay. already started to to talk about the grandmothers, but uh, if you want to elaborate, mm, all I want to say before hey, oh, Frida, you want to start? Oh well, I'll just say that uh, I'm really excited to be working with some young uh, producers, and uh, boy, they're smart and they and they're hardworking and and uh, speak multiple languages and things, some of them at the, uh, I mean, I'm learning from working with them that, um, that I might not, it, it, everything might not end with me, you know, <laughs> that, that, uh, that if I'm not around, there'll be some uh, women also carrying on, maybe not wings, but something with their skills. Um, what I have mostly learned is that I used to think that youth were the future and they are really the present. They are really taking on and they have made amazing contributions teaching us. They tell me here that um, what I have contributed, but I always tell them that they have to understand that they gave me back my youth. They don't dive if I don't dive. So I'm still diving at 72 because they don't go in the water if I don't go in the water. The democracy is totally different than I. Everybody has to be in everything together. Otherwise, if somebody stays behind, they struggle and they suffer to bring them back in. And that's why I think that they are bringing a wealth to the way we live today that is not that is creating future but that is very much in the present and I also agree with Frida that they have a way of interacting with the technology that is one of our biggest flaws in the sense that it moves so quickly I don't even have sometimes I think I don't have the energy and they come up with the way to do it and they teach me and then we go together. It's very intergenerational. Um, 
the other questions, I'll ask them all three together. Oh, um, thank you. Um, I'll ask the other three questions all together. Um, if you could have all the resources and community you needed, what is essential now? Um, what can we do to raise up feminism before capitalism kills us all? And what do we need to advocate to fundraisers and leaders um, and work towards together in this phase of life? I think that question was directed at Jen, wasn't it? I think it's directed at all of you. So, so uh, you were all sort of um, in this phase of life. So, so what's needed? Um, um, what, how does she say it? Uh, what do we need to advocate to funders and leaders and to work toward together? It looks like you're doing it, Tracy. I'm reading here in the chat, trust-based philosophy, I mean, sorry, philanthropy is asking foundations to stop the mistrust and to honor communities. It is a That's relatively it. new initiative, she says, that we need them to know your example as they plan to go around to many foundation regional associations. There are 40. We should, oh, she says, we should have you do a short radio tape or offer a two to three page story on what trust really made happen. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think you're on the right track, Tracy. <laughs> I asked the youth that I work with the boys and the girls, what is what, what what it was that they needed from us. And you know what they said? We need you to believe in us, to listen to us and to believe yeah. in us when we tell you that we know what we can do because adults are always telling us what to do and how to do it. And don't listen enough and don't believe in us. Really, the kids who are very vulnerable situation here in my community, all they need is somebody to believe in them so that they can also believe in themselves. Um, Jen, do you have a comment on, on the questions? Well, I, I guess it's the uh, that um, that we're part of the same movement and, mm -hmm. and we have to, that movement has to understand itself in that way, that both the funders and the people that uh, yes. are funded have, have to uh, collaborate on a, uh, on a movement because we're really at a terrible time in the world but for so many reasons. And it is a problem of patriarchal capitalism that has created this, this terrible situation. And so we need, as women funders, particularly non-patriarchal funders, we need to, uh, to link with uh, everybody who is funding the, the movement with their own lives and all of their intelligence. Oh, yes, so. very good. And we need to use our own intelligence in our lives for it too, uh, our, as funders. I have a, a supplemental question actually for Frida, and that is how is community radio funded? I, I assume it, I know that public radio has um, uh, fundraising drives periodically, but um, is community radio the same uh, model? Um, some, well, there are a lot of different ways that community radio is funded. This campus station where I worked uh, now they've started doing on-air fundraisers, but before they just relied on uh, student fees and uh, that was enough to, and they had the free space from the university. So uh, sometimes there's, uh, usually there's very little funding in community radio, um, but uh, yeah, they, they get donations from the community, from listeners. Uh, they might uh, have um, trying to think what other models I've seen of, of oh, sometimes there is government funding. Uh, sometimes um, they do, they sell things like t-shirts and stuff like that. But you know, it, it doesn't, once you get your license, 
it doesn't cost you that much to run a community radio station. And sometimes when you do get the money, it destroys the station's culture. Um, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting used to give um, community stations uh, some funding. Uh, supposedly it was to buy national programming, but, uh, and they were giving the same to public stations. But um, we found that like KPFA radio in, uh, in Berkeley where Catherine was working, they had a women's department and then um, there were people there working there who wanted to make professional level salaries and they took the money from the women's department to give themselves higher salaries. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you start the, the professionalization of it, it, I mean, it's a clash of cultures and um, it can be a real problem. I mean, for a while, they, this woman who had been the head of the women's department, when she became the program director, she wanted to cancel the women's program because she said, well, it's not professional. They have a different host every week. How can the, how can the listeners identify with this? And I wasn't there anymore, but the women used, from that show used to call me up in Austin and say, they're going to cancel the show. And I would call up Ginny and say, I heard you're going to cancel the show. Please don't cancel the show. So that was the, and um, I think for a while it was canceled, but now it's back. So, uh, and, and they're doing really great work. This this the women's program at uh, at KPFA. So, yeah. the community. I I I do a, a Saturday show. That's why I cannot be in these programs with you. I do a daily sh uh, a weekly show on Saturdays in a radio station that is a community radio station, one hundred years old but it, had, it has also become um, a licensed station, if you want to call it. And the funding nowadays is multiple here. Some of it comes from the government. Most of it comes from the community. Mm, uh, some of it comes from the people who pay to have airtime there, and they do fundraisers also. It has to be multiple strategy. Today, nobody can put all the eggs in one basket because um, the type of funding that we all uh, get and need is, is uh, small, important, because it's small also, because then it doesn't come with the kind of time that Frida was talking about. Mm -hmm. I have one more um, supplementary questions. How can we listen to your current shows? Talking about um, Wix. Well, um, you can uh, get your local community radio station to carry it and listen there. That's a good strategy. Uh, you can also uh, go to the website uh, wingsradio.org slash WordPress and the, sh the current shows get put up there. You can also subscribe by email. I send out almost 500 emails every week uh, some of it to radio stations and some of it to individuals, and they listen that way. So uh, those are main ways. I've been trying to get into, uh, supposedly Pacifica was going to start this podcast network, and, and I got things set up on it, but the, the podcast network was supposed to provide us with the, the things that we needed to be on all the other uh, podcast sources and I haven't seen anything about that yet so um, you know it could become a podcast as well uh, of, you know out in the world and the radio program that I produce on Saturdays is uh, can be heard um, in uh, Facebook of Radio Casino but it's in Spanish in Radio Casino and it's called La Hora Brava and uh, it airs every Saturday Mm -hmm. uh, because it's in uh, Facebook, it's a pain in the neck because since they put it on Facebook, then you cannot use any music because of, you know, um, royalties and stuff. And mm -hmm. I get really angry because we play some music that we produce here and they take it out because then um, Facebook uh, cuts them off if they don't have the permits. It's a, but it's good because at least the voice comes out and it's there in Facebook. And wow. it is the radio station that has the highest, the highest audience in the country. And the program on Saturdays, Laura Brava, has the highest audience. So 
um, you know, people um, hear it in Costa Rica uh, a lot. Wow. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. and Wings so, has a Facebook page too, uh, Wings Radio uh, on Facebook, and, and I post the most recent program at uh -huh. the, of the page. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. So, um, Frida and Maria, just make sure that you send the links or contact information to Diane and we'll post it with underneath the video so that when people are uh, re-watching the video that they can know how to contact you. All right, that would be great. So let's see if Liliana has another question. Yeah, I have another question from Paola Melchiori. He says, thank, uh, you, thank you very much and a big hug to Maria that I haven't seen in many, many years. And I would like to ask my dear to tell us a little more on how this multi-generational community is organized. How is it framed? Is it only a women's community? No. And then uh, she says, what the main aspect you think is worthy? We know beyond perhaps what you have already said. That, that, that last part, I don't wait. I don't understand that part. Yeah, she just wants to, she says, uh, what are the main aspects you think is important that we know beyond what you have already said? Wow. Paola, it's good to hear from you. Woo. Um, what can I say? No, it's not only women. We, in, the, in this community, Everybody is organized in multiple ways. We have women's groups of young women. We have children's diving camps. We are organized intergenerationally to deal with ocean and land issues, intergenerationally, interculturally, because it's the indigenous people's movement in the highlands. It's the Afro community about their culture and coastal land. It is all of us who came to live here to be able to stay with them here. And so um, it's the intergenerational is also um, both sexes and genders, whatever you want to call it. And it's um, also multi-generationally regarding the land rights. The ocean is mostly the youth and the older fisher people, you know, it combines identity, um, it combines pertaining to the land, it combines interests. Um, it's very multiple and I form part of about seven um, community organizations right now. I can be in seven because there are so many people engaged and what they want from us is the knowledge that we have acquired throughout our life. And what we want from the youth is the energy and the new knowledge that they have from the combination that they make of being connected globally and living on the land like all of us. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you, Maria. Judith, do you have another question for us? Um, I wonder if the two speakers have any questions for each other. I had, proposed to, I had proposed to Frida that at the end of our talk, each one of us ask each other a question because she had proposed a format of, of doing interview with each other instead of having a talk. But I didn't kind of agree with it because I had lost track of Frida except by listening to Wings. So I didn't know exactly what she was doing besides that. And she had no clue about me because I'm doing something so different, you know, than from what we did together that we, I discarded that we do interview each other, but he asked one question. So thank you, Judy. And Frida, my question for you, if you had to do it over again, what is it that you would bring that you didn't have from your experience? You mean uh, if I were to go back with, with what I know now? <laughs> exactly. 
I don't know if I could have done it. I think, you know, just finding my way from one situation to another was so much of what kept it interesting. If I, if I went back to the beginning, already knowing what I know now, I don't know if I would do it. <laughs> I do, <laughs> I'd rather do something else. <laughs> But, but, I'm, but I'm happy. I'm, I'm very happy. And I just want to add that uh, hearing about your community is interesting. I'm, I'm living on an island in a, a community where um, there's a fair amount of, of community solidarity and integration going on here. And we're supporting our local farmers and our, our local um, artisans. And um, we have I'm, I'm on the Demon Island Residents Association board now. And um, we deal with issues like there's an application to expand the oyster leases. Mm. And, you know, but what about the garbage from the oyster yeah. leases that the government isn't enforcing that these that does not be adding plastic into the ocean and stuff like that. So, you know, there are a lot of different environmental issues that come up. It, it's an exciting community and there's also a lot of arguments and things. I, uh, there were so many arguments on the community bulletin board. And uh, so I started a new, uh, it's like Facebook bulletin board. I started a new Facebook uh, group called Demon Island Arguing and invited <laughs> people to do their arguing over there. And actually some people worked out their arguments uh, on that. <laughs> Although now they're back to arguing on the main board again, but. <laughs> It's been fun. That's great. Frida, do you have a question for Maria? Uh, I have so many questions. Uh, so many have been answered now. Um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you hope for your future, Maria? Your own future? Wow. Um, I'm, you know, I'm dealing with the present, but my mother left me this message under my, my pillow when she died last November. Remember, life is too short, live it fully. And she died at, seven, at 99. And we have very good genes. So I decided that I have another life cycle of at least 25 or 30 years. And I better think about the future, but I can't. I live in the present and I am um, at currently, you know what happened to me? I'm gonna tell you, I, I don't know all of you, but you know, I fell in love head over heels this past year at 72, like when I was 17. And she is, God, I, this part please don't put in the, in the website because it's still not a relationship. But I felt head over heels, like if I was 17 years old and I didn't have that factor in my life after I finished my last relationship five years ago. And uh, it has just reminded me that living in the princess is all, also and always about um, being surprised. <laughs> there you go that's what it is very if surprised you, you wouldn't get to be surprised yeah i didn't think i could be surprised about that but it was like exactly like i fell in love when i was 17 but isn't that at the center of your life which is love is the answer love exactly. is the force that's, that's why i'm right? talking so much about love nowadays <laughs> <laughs> Oh, such an inspiration. It's so, it's so good and so true. Um, Liliana, do you have, oh, I see, oh dear. It's, uh, we only have about five more minutes. So what I'd like to do in these last five minutes is to see if um, Jen and Frida and Maria, if you have any last wise words for us before we actually close. Jen, would you like to? offer something? Is there something you'd like to say? Well, you know, I think love is really important too. And, and uh, um, I think it's great to be able to fall in love when you're 
72 or 80 or however old people are. And, and uh, it, there is a kind of being old is, uh, is really a special uh, time. And, and now that uh, women are able to get old and stay and live a long time, uh, some of us, uh, it is really a kind of a different country. It's a different way of being, and it's very special. So I hope everybody gets to do that. It's definitely a, a unique gift that we can live into. So thank you for that. Frida? Frida? I, see, I see that someone asked in the chat, how do we get on Frida's email list for WINGS? And I just want to say, email me. It's wings at wings.org, very easy to remember. And if you email that and say you'd like to be on the subscriber list, I'll add you. Perfect. And do you have any other closing words you'd like to have besides that? Thank you, everybody. This has really been exciting. I'm so glad to know all these things about what Maria is doing. Oh, she's still one of my great heroines. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Frida. How about you, Maria? When we were younger, many of us had to work on our inner child. It was called, right? Now, as women of age, I suggest that you try to work on an ancestral elder persona, whether you write or not, like my Tonaina character, that you try to create one or find one in your own cultures. There is another one here in the forest who is called Madre Monte, and I believe Angela is in this list, also, all, all Angela. Angela connected Guadalupe Urbina and I, a, a folk singer of Costa Rica, who um, I have met again, and she has uh, created, she didn't create it, she has drawn into Madre Monte, which is another Tonaina, a Costa Rican Madre Monte from the forest. And both of us are working on creating a symphony of the ocean and the forest with a dialogue between Tonaina and Madre Monte to be able to uh, connect both ecosystems into our lives and our storytelling also. Do that. You won't be sorry. Now that you have the inner child very much integrated into your own lives, get your elder Tonaina from your culture or your life or make her up. And it's wonderful to talk to her and to write with her. <laughs> That's beautiful. Very, very encouraging. Well, I want to thank everyone who's with us today and who's viewing this as a recording. Um, I want to thank Frida and Maria and Jen for being with us live today from all your distant places, from Jen in Italy, Frida in Canada, and Maria in Costa Rica. Um, and I'm in the United States. So we are an international group, an international feminist for the gift economy. Um, this recording will be on our website, the maternal gift economy movement.org. If you have any questions or want to contact um, the speakers here, uh, please remember that you can come to our website or you can email us directly. Um, maternalgifteconomy at gmail.com. And we'll make sure that you get in touch with the speakers um, in this salon or in any of the past salons. We'd love to hear your feedback. We also hope that you're gonna join us in two weeks. April the 10th is our next salon and it happens to be our salon number 10 with Elena Skoko, who is our uh, technical support. Elena, can you um, put your camera on and wave at us? And um, she is in um, Croatia. So Elena will be our speaker, um, one of our speakers, and Charito Basa, 
who is also in Italy. Um, and we are so delighted that you could join us. So everyone who has, who's on the screen now, could you uh, put your camera on and wave? Everyone, please be well, be safe, be kind to each other, and we're going to see you in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Letitia. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.